Thanks, Nancy. Um, I'm an old um, wool farmer from Yass in New South Wales, so I'm always excited to get into a shed with some wool in it and um, look at a clip. So, um, uh, and just a beautiful fleece up there on the on the um, stand that I was having a a quick look at. So, um, my job's uh, very brief. Uh, just fantastic to see such a large uh, group of people here and such a mix of people. Um, I've caught, been caught a little bit on the hop, so I want to acknowledge country. Um, I'm told it's Gupra Gupra, but I may have that slightly wrong. Um, but I want to acknowledge um, Indigenous people. We just had the absolute pleasure of working with Aboriginal communities uh, throughout the state, have such a tremendous amount to learn from them, so I want to recognise the traditional owners, uh, elders, past and present. Um, and just uh, thank uh, Diane Ian. Uh, for their hospitality today. We've got some others, uh, Kent Broad and Tim Wiley are going to talk to us and a whole mob uh, later this afternoon. Um, and I, I think it's um, just a really exciting time in agriculture. Uh, anyone in the audience who's experienced um, sort of the frost issues uh, in the recent weeks, our, our thoughts are with you. Uh, that's not easy when you're uh, looking at a big crop. Um, and uh, when I think about the issues that we're exploring today, I suppose I, I reflect on um, the importance of innovation and retaining uh, a really open mind uh, to exploring new ways of doing things. And uh, one thing is for certain, uh, in the scientific world, uh, there are, are, are two big frontiers uh, opening. Uh, one is in understanding our biological systems better and what they can bring to our productivity. And the second is figuring out uh, what to do uh, with carbon, how to manage our carbon cycle, and how to address the challenges that we confront with climate change. And there's this fascinating nexus between biology and carbon. Uh, which we don't understand enough about. Um, there's lots of people experimenting. There's lots of people doing exciting things, and I'm just really interested to, to come here, sit down and listen and learn. So um, welcome to the day, and uh, thank you for all coming along. National company. Uh, we're in the middle of a farm at the moment and um, just thank you for giving your time to come. Uh, Don and I are overly prepared with this at the moment because it's, um, it's just a bit of last minute notice and um, we're in the middle of hay at the moment, so actually you people beat me to the shed the first time I've stepped in it, so <laughs> thanks to all the crew that got it all organised. Um, this property here adds up to about 26,000 hectares and um, yeah, we're, we're sort of in the centre of the farms at the moment and they spread out a, a bit. Um, I think our thing for today, to come along today, Di's going to do a bit of a presentation of where we're at and what, we, what we'll see. Um, I'm just going to try and add lib and just any questions, just feel free to ask. I think probably the main thing I'd like to get across, we'll drive around as you, you, you've been driving through the farm, when you're here you've been, whatever direction you've come in, you've been on the farm for the 20 k's. And, um, the crops that you'll see and the pastures you'll see, it's a whole combination of different things. So there's multi-species cover crops with different diverse ranges in. There's just straight native uh, pastures around the place. There's crops that have been dissed into um, perennial grasses, native perennial grasses, and some have worked well, some haven't. There's all different stages and experiments. Really our farm, we looked at our farm for the last 20 years has been one massive R&D project. We're both fourth generation farmers. We went north, we didn't inherit a farm, we went north, so, um, spent a lot of time up in the Kimberleys and got a different insight when we came back farming to how we go about it. So for us it was about setting up an operation, running an operation as close to nature as we can get and it wasn't, we didn't have any perceived goals that we want to make this profit, we want to do this, we're just going to let it go to where we could. 
with the natural uh, goalposts that we're aiming for and the outcomes, the food outcomes in it. And it's been, been a journey. Um, we've made lots of mistakes. Sorry, I just want to check that the Yeah. Can everyone hear? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, it's been a journey. We've made lots of mistakes. We have a theory here. If you're not making a mistake, you're not trying hard enough. And um, and it's still a work in progress. You know, we're nowhere near where um, we'll probably end up getting to. Um, it's all a work in progress. Probably one thing I'd like to make clear. You know, you look at, around the industry. You know, we've come. I, I know in my career from high input farming, um, just of what, what how it is the standard type farming, to what we do now. And I see this division come across the industry, whether it be them and us or whatever, and I just think that's a load of rubbish. It's, um, this is what we do, um, it's how we go about it, and we're totally honest about what you see, what we've done. And if anyone can take anything out of that and put back into their operation, we've achieved our goals. So we're about, we've got to the stage now of pushing the boundaries. We'll put things in where we don't know whether it'll work or not. We'll make mistakes, we'll learn from that, we'll just keep improving and improving. So I don't like to see this divide. I think every farmer that's out there in the industry at the moment is a really good farmer because of the sheer fact that they're there. And to be able to survive in what we've all been through is hard to do. And I just hope to see that by people like ourselves doing different things and if other people do completely different things again, I'd like to look over the fence at theirs and see what we can all get out of it and where we can come. So, yeah, enjoy the day. Um, any questions, feel free to ask like you see. You'll see something and you'll think, what the heck's going on in that paddock? Well, there's a reason, you know, whether it be a late sown crop. Um, we had the same issues as everyone else. We had transmission drop out of a new tractor halfway through seeding and lost us nearly three weeks. Um, so we've got crops sown in July um, down on the flats. Um, we've got crops crop sown early April. So we've got a whole range, you know. This year, first year ever, like last year, we averaged 87 mil for the growing season. This year, uh, up to this stage of the year last year, this year we're sitting on 420 mil at um, the same time, so it's been a big difference. We hit the situation for once where we actually, having that tractor break down probably hurt us a fair bit because that was our window to get our crop in, and then it came in too wet, we couldn't get on paddocks. And there's crops in the valley, and I don't think we're going down there because we're short of time. But um, we were to go back, and there was one, one big area there we are going to go back and put barley grass country, we're going to put some Indivix on it. You know, we do use some chemicals, but we detoxify them with the right microbial balance. But we couldn't get on it. And it's probably been the best move we've ever made. There's still barley grass there, but um, the crops have still done really well. I actually went out and just to test my curiosity, and actually went out there with a hand sprayer and actually sprayed some of those, um, that air, an area um, over about a 10 metre square. And it's, it's, it's interesting because that area probably that crop is half of what the other crop is, even though it's got the barley grass in, and it's been frosted and buggery, and um, the other stuff's actually not too bad. So out there today, I actually haven't been out in the paddocks a lot because we've been too busy. Um, let's see if we can find frost. I, I honestly haven't looked. I'm not really interested in looking for some what it can be. We've done all we can do, but what we can show out there is this is what we've grown in the same boat as everyone else. And we just could see the comparisons, you know, what we have gotten frost out there. I'll hand it over to Dolly and she can go. Well yep. um, Ian's touched on a little bit of the stuff, but yeah, just basically um, our starting point uh, 20 something years ago was 1600 acres and we've grown a fair bit in that time, but we were um, standard high input sort of farmers in the beginning. Um, but I guess even in the 90s, um, there was quite a bit of, well, then I guess it was below average rainfall years and that's where we started to see things like crops haying up early um, and yeah, not getting that full rain potential and sort of trying to look at what some of the issues were that were um, preventing getting that best outcome from your crop. But then if you look at that rainfall chart there, um, things got progressively worse after that. We actually changed our farm practices really around 2001 um, and the 90s have been pretty kind. 
and effectively since then the rainfall patterns have taken a deep slide and this ends in 2017 and I'd like to add that um, 2018 was a, oh, I guess it was a below average rainfall year because it was a very dry finish, but 2019 and 20 here as Ian said a minute ago, they were about 100 um, or less mill growing season rainfall years. So the red lines are getting a bit more frequent again. So I don't really want to think of that as being um, a potential for going forward. And luckily this year's had a real um, curve ball and put another blue one on there. So that's fantastic. Um, but I guess what I was trying to say there is really just started to look at risk management. So how we could try and get our farming system as resilient as possible um, to cope with what might be getting dished up um, climatically and environmentally. Um, just so that we could survive. And we're fortunate in 2001 we went along to a, a presentation in Perth, it was a four day workshop with Dr Elanning and Dr Arden Anderson who gave us some real insights into I guess how the microbial world, world can function and look at nutrient cycling and um, immune system function in plants and animals as a result of having those things working for you. Um, and that really tweaked our interest and we really just got, decided to go down that path. And partly too, it was uh, out of a financial risk management as well because the microbial system is actually something that can occur of its own accord. Um, once you get a few different things in place, it wasn't the case of putting more and more different fertilisers or whatever on. And it was actually about making the system simpler because uh, the more we were able to get that microbial system functioning throughout the whole landscape, whether it be through the animals or the plants, there was less need to be out in the paddocks looking for problems. Um, over time, those things tend to smooth themselves out a bit. So we started off with taking out um, fungicides and insecticides very early on in the piece, and that's just a picture of different rhizosheath development in that very early stage with a plant that did or didn't have a fungicide seed dressing. And we focus very closely on the animal integration, um, mainly because they're out there across the landscape all the time, and a lot of the science now is showing very clearly um, how effective those animals can be in transforming the landscape. There's been opportunities for microbes to be moved throughout the landscape, and we're all very aware of the nutrient cycling side as the animals can take um, nutrient from high nutrient parts of the landscape into lower nutrient parts of the landscape. And of course there with the manure transferring um, different microbes. So part of our plan here with the whole farming system is having access to native vegetation or where possible um, and increasing the native diversity in the pasture paddocks and the cropping paddocks so that those animals have got as diverse a range of foods as they can possibly access. Um, and it's been quite a phenomenal outcome seeing the actual animal health and how that's progressed. And it was really interesting just um, seeing some of the work of Dean Ravel and uh, Fred Provenza and really focusing on that and seeing those outcomes, those improved outcomes with protein synthesis and um, the wool uh, we've been able to produce off these animals now has um, exceeded our expectations, I guess, to the point now we're actually dealing direct with fashion houses in Europe who buy a whole clip um, at a premium price because they know how well it um, performs and just the softness and drapeability, I guess, that it has. But it hasn't been through any over-management on our behalf. The animals have basically been doing them themselves. They're all self-replacing livestock. Um, and as you know, Dean Ravel and um, Fred Brevenza talk about having animals so that they can learn those inherent behaviours of how to select appropriate foodstuffs. Um, yeah, why would I want to interview with that wisdom when they know better? Um, another person that's been really critical in our pathway has been Dr Christine Jones in understanding about the liquid carbon pathway. I guess before um, all we were familiar with was the labile carbon um, and building residue levels, um, organic matter levels on top to, I guess, to try and build carbon that way. But for our environment with it being so dry, a lot of the time it was hard enough to get enough pasture to cover the ground, let alone um, be building any residue levels. 
And yeah, with Christine's work talking about the liquid carbon pathway and getting carbon at depth, um, it was a real eye opener to us because once we got that microbial system functioning and we had some soil tests done um, under the SCART protocol in 2012, and that demonstrated clearly to us that there was big changes happening in the carbon um, sequestration in, at depth in the soil. So as those plant roots were going deeper into the soil profile, there was more and more carbon being deposited there. So it, it, it gave you a hope that um, you could actually do things in some of these drier environments, whereas you know, sometimes the actual plant biomass above the soil surface might um, not necessarily be indicating what's actually going on below the surface. So part of our farming practice, I guess, has been really focusing on um, restoring the indigenous microbial populations. We do um, source uh, aerobic compost and we're making our own um, Johnson 2 static compost at the moment and looking at expanding that going forward just so that we um, are putting other microbes in. The Johnson Sioux in particular is sourced with our own sheep manure, so it is um, yeah, putting out whatever native microbes our animals are able to access. Um, but also partly with that is even just the metabolites, etc. that are in the composting process. By putting those out in the paddocks, we find that they do trigger, um, they give the right signals to them native microbes to actually fire up again and, and start to do what they need to do. Interesting um, on a wadril soil type, which is, we're all pretty familiar with how harsh that is with acid pH. Uh, these soil samples are actually on um, very low organic matter. A lot of the organic matters are 0 0.1, 0 0.2s um, when you start. So not a lot of um, nice homes there for microbes to grow and develop, but you see that rhizosheath when you've got a, a seed that's dressed with a compost extract or worm liquid or something, some biological um, stimulant that can assist those plant roots as they emerge to be coated with um, microbes and they can get going and do some amazing things. I really like this um, the picture with the on that right side with the, the fungal hyphae across the hole there, just showing how soil structure can be built and having those air spaces which are so important for water infiltration and air infiltration into the soil. But then um, <coughs> Phil Lee, who's a very generous soul, um, gave me a picture of um, a plant sample he had that had had synthetic fertiliser use and there was very little soil aggregation around the plant roots at all um, and really little opportunity to be doing much in the way of building soil structure. So I guess that's where we look at things that are happening throughout the wheat belt with compaction and poor water infiltration. Um, yeah, we need to take a, perhaps a, a close look at what is happening uh, with those plant root systems. Are they really working to our best capacity um, to build that um, opportunity for the water to go into the soil? So one of the things we do is um, liquid inject. So behind the the yellow bin at the front just full of seed and we've got the liquid um, in the tank at the back of that tractor. And so we put the compost extract and worm liquid down with the seed as we sow the seed. And then we've got the foliar spray, which is really quite effective. Um, regardless of the season, whether it be a dry one or a wet one, that foliar spray seems to really give the plants an extra boost and probably encourages those plant roots to go even further into the soil so it can hang on a bit better with a dry spring. Mm. Another real key person in our learning has been Walter Yenner, who's a, a fantastic Australian scientist originally from CSIRO and he uh, gave us a lot of understanding about the importance of getting what happening below the soil surface being um, and more important than what was happening above because at the end of the day it was what those plant roots were doing that was deciding our future for the next year and I think Ian was um, sort of touching on a little bit that our goalposts have always been about um, perhaps building the soil carbon, building the soil health over and above um, crop yield in any one particular year so rather than doing something that might boost crop yield in particular for that year going forward 
would that practice um, be to the detriment of our soil building capacities? So, in effect, our more medium term future. So, like on a year like this, which big temptation to go and put out lots of nitrogen because there's lots of rainfall, um, still didn't do that. So, we've still got crops out there that have had no artificial fertilisers at all supplied, um, still grown a very, very reasonable crop. But the key there for us is to make sure that we don't put on an excess of something that would actually chew up the carbon, which is going to put ourselves back um, going forward. So we want to be building those carbon stocks all the time um, and so that we can really reinforce the resilience of our farming system. So it's not always about maximum yield, it's about optimum yield for taking a bigger step forward in our overall resilience and risk management. So yeah, building that soil carbon sponge effectively at the end of the day. Um, some Another learning that's been really interesting is just seeing the change in the weed profile. Um, we've seen, particularly on this farm, I guess, a lot of return of native uh, perennial plants, whether they be summer or winter active, and as they become more dominant, the actual winter weeds don't proliferate. So. I don't know what the relationship is there, but certainly um, whether it's just a change in the soil ecology and the different plant expression, um, what the story is, we're not too sure. But at the moment, we've been able, this last season, we've put in oh, probably a couple of thousand hectares into pasture cropping with no knockdown chemicals at all, no pre-emergent chemicals. Um, some of them it's worked well, some of them hasn't been so great. Um, we've played around with disc seeders and a thyme seed. We're very fortunate at the moment we've got a disc and a thyme seeder so we can play around with both of those um, and just see what the best outcomes are. At the moment, Ian's pretty convinced that the thyme seed has done a better job into that and that may change as things improve. It might be a bit early days to um, you know, have a disc seeder doing that job and we're thinking perhaps you know, there's a little bit more disturbance around some of those thick um, perennial root masses might just help the crop to establish better. But yeah, we, we'll still keep playing around with both and just see what happens over time because as that soil continues to improve, that might change too. We, we don't really know, we're just flying by the seat of our pants at the moment and having a crack. But um, I really like this photo because it just had the wheat plant alongside a radish plant and just seeing um, the difference in the root structure there. So what they were doing and which plant was going to be more competitive at the end of the day. Once again, on to a, a wadgel soil. Here, we were, this was year two on this farm here, um, but it was really interesting just seeing the root penetration. And you can see it's a very compacted soil as well, but those roots were penetrating down five or 600 mil there, um, just on year two into that compacted soil. Now, you wouldn't think that'd be possible given the pH was um, four and below um, from about 15 centimetres down sort of goes against all our learning that when a plant root hits those pHs that it would J curve or burn off, um, but they still managed to get down there. So whether that was just the protection of that microbial sheath around the plant roots that gave it that opportunity. And then of course, once you're getting down to those levels, you can get the carbon down there further as well, which is gonna help for next year. Um, we did some testing on this farm. After three and a half years, we were able to see uh, changes in pH rising um, without using lime. So this is purely out of um, plant root function and microbial systems in the soil. So yeah, rather than carting lime onto farm. Another thing that's been, a, I guess, a real benefit too, and, and probably really quite relevant at the moment with the prices of fertiliser going up, is just the capacity to have um, fertilisation occurring just in it as the soil's progressing in its health and fertility. Um, done a lot of discussions with Dr Christine Jones regarding the formation of um, nitrogen in the soil, even under a grass-based system, and people think, look at you sometimes and think, yeah, you're completely off your tree. But um, there's been a lot of work now looking at archaea and different associative microbes that actually can form around a, a grass plant root system um, and create nitrogen or draw in nitrogen from the atmosphere. So when we did the, um, the soil carbon testing in 2012 that looked at 
you know, the changes in the soil carbon. There was also significant changes in the soil nitrogen stocks um, within all those soil profiles as well. And it was really interesting because the farm that was com being compared to had had a lupin phase two years prior to all the soil testing being done. And yet, even though we'd had a continuous cereal um, cropping program um, for the five years prior, there was more nitrogen stocks in our farm. Um, so it really, oh, I don't know, it was quite mind-boggling at the time to see that. Um, and we have been able to move totally away from um, using nitrogen sources and just letting yeah, the plants do the job. Another really interesting part too was just that soil water holding capacity. And I think when you um, look around the wheat belt a lot of the times, and particularly over summer with uh, chemical fallow coming back into vogue um, and some of the soil amelioration techniques that are happening, um, perhaps interfering with the capacity of that soil to actually um, infiltrate and store water. I think it's a, um, something we really have to be very conscious of because at the end of the day if we're losing a lot of it to evapor evaporation or running off the landscape particularly would have happened um, early on this year with some of the big rainfall events that did occur how much of it did wash off and how much of it did um, infiltrate the soil is a really important point um, just I think I mentioned too about the changing soil ecology and the different plants coming up and so we've seen a lot of the native grasses returning um, and in volume and density which is pretty exciting to see and giving us a lot of opportunity for that pasture cropping and we will go out to some paddocks and or oh, there's one paddock we can access to not, with not too great a difficulty but um just seeing some of that biodiversity coming back into the grazing paddocks and the sheep being able to um, utilize that very well um, Economics at the end of the day, we've all got to stay in business doing all this stuff. I think in the early time, early days it was pretty quick to see changes in the soil, um, what do you call it, resistance. So the tractors, they've all got their fuel usage per hectare and what is it, wheel slip? That tells you exactly how hard it is for that machine to be pulling through um, seeding. Um, and we were able to see quite uh, dramatically in the early days just that change. So that Tractors were using less fuel, there was less resistance to the bar going through. Um, we actually experienced less machinery hours, we're not having to do so many passes over a paddock, which at the end of the day ends up with more money in your pocket. We do minimal summer spraying, we virtually did none other than a few patches of roly poly last summer, even though it was a really um, high rainfall summer. Uh, we we're actually trying to deal with roly-poly now using a crimper. We hired one last year and it was really effective. We're looking at trying to purchase one of those, even though they're fairly expensive bits of equipment. But um, if it can reduce any passes over summer, it's going to work out in our favour in the long run. Um, and just by the plant and the animal's immune system function being fostered, uh, we're having, yeah, not having to go and deal with problems all the time I guess. Um, haven't had to use fungicide post-emergent for a long time or um, same with insecticides, we haven't applied any of those for 20 something years. The animals um, haven't needed drenching for that same sort of time frame, we haven't fed grain to the animals and they've, they've evolved a system now where they're just so good at extracting nutrient from a diverse range of pastures that are around, um, they just hold good weight, um, very highly fertile and very productive animals without too much intervention. Um, I guess yeah, improving your water holder capacity is fairly obvious and what that might do with a, a dry spring. Um, but what we've also noticed too even with some of the drought years is good hectolitre weight um, over and above what you'd expect with a poor finish um, such that often it's about 8% higher than what um, you'd expect. I've got some data from I think it was the West Midlands group when they did some um, hectolitre weight trials and yeah their average hectolitre weight was um, I think it was about 77 and ours was about 83 and that was on a dry finish for here and their area is a lot kinder finishing country normal, normally. Um, I guess fairly obvious too with a significant reduction in the fertiliser and chemical 
costs. Um, we're probably sitting around about 30% this year of what a standard program might have been. Um, and at the end of the day, it all adds up to being reduction in risk. And I guess with the way things are happening, um, the variability that's it's always been there, but it's probably fairly um, significant now even when you look at the rainfall charts that I had at the beginning. Um, yeah, those dry ones are more frequent. And then we have a, a real whammo like this year, which we actually had some water log in parts, which has been you know, something we're very unfamiliar with. But they all come with their own challenges. And, and then the frost, which we're all familiar with as well. Um, how can we have a farming system that we can have had good outcomes as far as your, your yield goes, but without putting your neck on the line to be yeah, trying to get absolute maximum dollar out of everything and then running the risk of it um, going toes up. Is, um, is the marketing. Uh, it's been really good. Di mentioned the wool. Um, it's happening with grain, and then on top of that, you know, I think the the carbon is a really exciting thing, and um, soil and tree-based carbon, which Kent will talk about, um, our relationships, and um, I think it's a place where a lot of farmers have put too hard to go, and this is probably what we're working towards now is actually getting a blueprint that makes it really simple for farmers and helps make all this system as a part of a whole circular farming system as, as part of a whole module. So um, Kent will explain on that and um, I, and yeah, you can explain that. Just, um if you want to have a sample, some kind gentleman brought a loaf from there yesterday and brought it up for us, so we've cut it up for everyone to have a bit of a sample. So all um, grown on this property. But that's been a really exciting thing as well, just having that opportunity to see how your grains perform, what they taste like, and the customer response has just been phenomenal um, in his shop. He's usually sold out well and truly before lunchtime, so yeah, he does a great job. He's got his own stone ground mill in the shop, so he mills it fresh and bakes it the following day. So he's just doing a superb job with a great team down there. But um, yeah, just all the... Uh, things that we can sort of look at going forward, I guess. I, I didn't know what that group was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I think um, Nancy did ask to talk about the challenges, and I think, I guess farming's a challenge whichever way you go, but I think uh, it's a matter of that learning journey, and whilst we've, you know, we've made plenty of mistakes and had plenty of things go wrong, um, You've always learnt from that. I think that's the key, and I suppose it's just trying to take those steps that you feel comfortable with, that you can financially manage. Um, when it comes down to risk, we've been just trying to focus on reducing the risk overall. But um, we started on a smaller farm and just kept adding it on. So we've been doing the same practice for 20-something years, with you know minor changes as we've gone along and learnt. But it's been across all different sorts of soil types, from south of Darren to up here to and the wild catchem area and all the soils seem to respond in a positive fashion but some at different rates and one of the key factors there I think that makes the biggest difference is the level of organic matter in the soil. If you've got a good organic matter level in the soil to start with I think it can go forward fairly quickly but even having said that we've, as I said we've started with lots of ones at about 0.1% organic matter um, and they still respond fairly quickly within that two or three year period and start to make some significant changes. So it's not all loss, it's, it you know, might look a bit hard to start with, but it does make a fairly big um, change fairly quickly. I think, um, probably one just quick thing to uh, touch on before we bore you too much, is um, one of our goalposts is our so social and cultural goalposts. And um, unless we've got thriving communities out here, and good teams of people, we've absolutely got nothing. And um, so if we look at a year, like after a drought year, but we've, we've ticked our carbon boxes, it's been a lean yield year, you know, when you're talking, you know, under 90 mil of rain, and that year was still a, we, we still we still didn't lose money on that year, we um, made a bit of money. Um, but 
we've ticked those social, we've got a good group of people, they're all happy, they want to be here. You know, this operation is attracting people into the team that haven't had anything to do with farming, coming out of different occupations and um, building that real community on the farm and then overflowing that into the main community, the local towns, uh, spending locally, supporting the footy clubs, doing all those things. So. Our main focus is we've got to really work hard and as farmers, and there's only a few of us left um, around the state these days, it's dwindling, um, we've got to stick together and work through these things and, um, and I think by as Dice says, reducing risk and if anyone can take anything out of this and we can um, work on that depression side of it that you see happening all around the state, I, I think there are outcomes and their goalposts that we're all going to be working towards. Um, yeah, we had to come to this one, I guess, because it was the most accessible. The other paddocks um, probably a bit harder to get to with all the different types of vehicles we've got. But anyway, um, Wadgel soil type, as you can see, so low pH. Um, when we first started working this farm, it was cape weed and brome grass dominant. Um, there was a bit of this grass, I'm not too sure what its name is, but being a low succession uh, perennial grass. But now we're just starting to see more of these ones coming through and getting a lot more density. And the Mulla Mulla, um, we've been talking a fair bit about the Mulla Mulla, um, yeah, coming all of its own accord. This paddock didn't have much grazing over the winter, so it hasn't really benefited from that. But the Mulla Mulla itself, if you give it a good hard graze, it'll stay green most of the year. So we had um, green cover through a lot of the farm, even through the drought in 19 and 20. Um, we were able to lamb ewes on Mulla Mulla, this tall, have beautiful protection and ample feed for them. I was speaking to a scientist from Murdoch University and she was telling me that um, she'd done some study on Mulla Mulla and comparing it to chicory as a feed source and it had a higher nutrient um, profile than what the chicory had. So that was pretty exciting given that Mulla Mulla is a native plant and it comes for free. Um, I couldn't ask for much better than that as part of a mixed um, pasture species. Um, yeah, so anyway, just seeing the transformation from being annual weed dominant with cape weed and brome to moving into a perennial native um, pasture base. So still got a way to go, but it's a, and at a low succession level at the moment, but each year something comes and shows more. The diversity seems to increase of its own accord um, from one year to the next. So that's a pretty exciting space to be in. The only thing we've done has been We've probably put a, two crops into this paddock since we've had it. So putting that biological stimulant through there with the compost and the worm liquid and stuff. And I think that's enough to help kick start that um, change in the soil ecology and start that process of changing the plant succession. And, 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 and what about management? Is this rotationally grazed or is it like or do you just eat it out and then move on? Um, no, everything gets a good rest phase, John. But um, yeah, we don't have enough um, livestock really at the moment but I guess we're just sort of working our way into you know having more sheep numbers in the winter time we do bunch them right up um, and have you know mobs of one to two thousand with ewes and lambs um, but as it starts to warm up with water resources and things we split them all up again too so every paddock doesn't get an ideal grazing attempt Fair each year yeah. so it's but it's um yeah just have it all pans out from one year to the next it's what we're showing here you know this is um nothing special country it's absolutely crap country and um just that, that transition and and i think our aim is here to show over a period of time and if, if these field days continued you'd see come back into the, the one spot well, where it's at now as Di said this is just a convenient location to go to off the road we could show other locations but time permitting where we have a hundred percent ground cover with ten times more diversity but what this still does show is where it starts and then later on we'll show you know in, in future years we'll, we'll put crop straight into this what kind of crop you'll grow into this with minimal chemical it's about a thousand hectares in this patch here so our aim is here is to we'll do a 
this will all go under soil carbon project. It will actually have a tree project in it as well. So to break these winds up on the hills, that's where there'll be banks of trees on your fence lines. So we can just multi-stack it with the livestock, cash crop, carbon, and actually just show a f profile of you know taking average country like this and you know what what we can turn it around into. When you crop into country like this, you see that hard pan breaking up because you see the crop, all these little tufts of crop. Crop might be like that, the tufts are like mm. that. And you see over the years it comes out in a mosaic pattern until it all actually ends up meeting up. So it's just what yeah. Tim's saying is patches not, but patches that grab it and just seems to grow and, Does it. and grow like that. Before this was cleared, this would have been a very diverse uh, mixture of plants, a plant community dominated by woody perennials. So that means it's a, in terms of plant community succession, they talk about apex communities. And apex communities are dominated by woody perennials above ground and dominated by fungus below ground. So we then come in and clear it and we take it back to bare and we destroy that community, but there's seed there. So this is a land that's recovering. This is a pioneer early phase community. And so the species that are here are the species that uh, are designed to rebuild f fertility. Um, and as the fertility grows, we'll get uh, more species come in that require higher fertility. And if you left this alone, it would go back to a woody dominated uh, community. So the pioneer species have got characteristics. Uh, they're the things we call weeds hmm. that will grow where there's very low fertility. They tend to be tend to be more annual and perennial. They've got a lot of small seed. Uh, they can grow in low fertility. They've got certain characteristics. This is actually a bit high. The, a really interesting species here is the mullamol because this is a true pioneer species, um, and it has a specific job to do. And that is when it's been studies, it's got, and it's not understood how it does it, it's got a magical ability to make phosphorus available, take it up and make it available. It's just um, the phosphorus levels in the plant or in the soils around the root can be 10 times or 100 times higher than it was out there. So that species is in the community to do a specific job to build your phosphorus. Um, when you're in the bush and it burns, Often you'll see that's when the legumes come back. You know, it might be stirred by your other plant. The point is to put the nitrogen back into the system. Yeah, mm. would be the only little bit of concern. Uh, the grasses will start to put the, um, the fungi back into it. So the original bush would have had all of these species there in very low numbers. We destroy it, destroy the fertility. And the ones that are needed will come back and rebuild it. As aggressively as the fertility build, other species will come back and will get more diverse. Yep. So the cha challenge for us is, uh, if we want to crop it, where does the crop fit in? How does the crop fit in? What does it, uh, Wheat isn't a pioneer species. There's it's obviously a, a lot of seed here, so the crop doesn't absolutely. really set it back. No, so there's a story as, oh, grass seed doesn't last in the soil for long. It's just absolutely... Yeah, how long's this country been cleared? Uh, early 80s. Yeah. yeah. So it's been here. There's a seed. We'll sit for that long. Is that, that photo I showed you? Biology and the fertility. So this is not a pioneer situation. This is a recovering moving to a lot one. So it'll be interesting to watch and interesting to figure out how do you put a crop into this without setting it back and allowing it to continue.